Okay, so we're B, group B31 and we're going to be proving to you by cases. The way this mini lecture is going to work out is we're going to start with an introduction and just a basic um, overview of what proof by cases actually is. Um, then we're going to go to a few examples and a conclusion. So what proof by cases is, is basically if we can't prove um, something by only using one case, we break it down into several different cases. Um, and what this is pretty much saying is for case one, um, or case two, and then all the way to case n, that is going to imply your q there. Um, which is also breaking down to say, for case one, that implies q, case two will imply q, all the way to case n implies q separately. Okay, so the first example we're going to do is the absolute value of a over b equals the absolute value of a over the absolute value of b, where b not equals zero. The first case we're going to start with, case one, is when we have a greater than equals zero, and b is greater than zero. Now what this is going to show is that the absolute value of a equals a, because the absolute value of positive is positive, and the absolute value of b equals b, because the absolute value of a positive is positive again. And this leads to having the absolute value of a over b equals a over b, which equals the absolute value of A or the absolute value of B because you can substitute these in here. Okay, so this is the second case for this example. We have A is greater than or equal to zero and B is less than zero in this case. Now, because A is always greater than zero, it's always positive, the absolute value is always positive, so we can say that. And in this case, we can say the absolute value of B equals negative B. Now, this might be a little bit tricky, but B is always negative here. So, B could be negative five or negative 10. And now, negative b, that comes from where if we take the negative of either of these, we're going to get the positive, 5 and 10. So that's why we can say the absolute value of b equals negative b in this case, because b is always negative. Now, we come over here, the original statement, we can negate that because b is always negative, so that's always going to be negative. We just bring the negative down, and then a equals the absolute value of a, negative b equals the absolute value of b, therefore this equals that. Now for case three, we have a is less than zero and b is greater than zero. b is greater than zero is always positive, so the absolute value of b equals b. And then this is just like before, since a is always negative, the negative of the negative is always positive, therefore you can say that the absolute value of a is equals negative b. When we go over here, it's basically the same thing. Start with this, you negate it because a is always less than zero, you move the positive over here. You can substitute b for absolute value of b, and then because we proved over there, you can substitute negative a for absolute value of a. For the fourth case for this example, we have both of them, a and b, are less than zero. And just like before, we can show that because of the double negative, the absolute value of a and b equals respectively a and b. Now, when you come over here, we start with the premise again, and then we'll just say that now a equals, now this equals a over b. And now we can say it's negative a over negative b because negative divided by negative is positive. And then using that, if we go back to here, we can see that the absolute value of b equals negative b. So that goes that to there. And then the absolute value of a equals negative a. So we can go from there to there. And that proves it again. And this is the fourth. And this is the fourth and final case. So after this and the other three cases, we've proven that for every possible combination, the absolute value of a over b equals the absolute value of a over the absolute value of b when b is not equal to zero. So, um, now going to discuss um, proof by cases, a second example. Um, this one should help clarify, it's a little different than the first. Uh, we'll start out, say you want to prove that n squared is greater than or equal to 2 to the n minus 1 for all integers that are positive and less than 7, right? So this is good for proof by cases because um, we have a finite set of cases to check. We have po positive integers less than 7. Well, that gives us a set of integers we can check. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Those are the only sets, or the only positive integers that fit. So if we check all of these, we can prove this statement. 
or disprove if it does not work that way. So let's uh, figure out a way to do that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to draw out a table, and that's going to be graphically very visually easy to see what we're talking about. So let's make a row here, n. Um, we have n's of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Remember, those are the cases we have to check. Um, we'll have n squared right here. And so let me just go through and fill out the table. 1 squared is 1. 2 squared is 4. 3 squared is 9. 16, 25, and 36. Right? So there's our list for n squareds. And we'll list our two of the n minus 1s. 2 n minus 1. Well, if n is 1, we're going to do 2 to the 0, which is anything to the 0 power is 1. Here we have um, 2 to the n minus 1, 2 to the 1 is this 2. Similarly, here we got 4, 8, 16, 32, right? So if we examine our table here for these this set of values, this case that this value is always less than or equal to this value. So here, 1 is equal to 1. Here, 2 is less than 4, or you can say 4 is greater than or equal to 2. 9 greater than or equal to 4. 16 is greater than or equal to 8. 25 greater than or equal to 36, or 16. 36 greater than or equal to 32. Now you can see why the domain was specified is to 6 if we look at 7. Just to see. It's outside of the range, but we have 7, then n squared is 49, but 2 to the n minus 1 is 64, which is not correct. So it's proved that on this interval, from positive integers less than 7, we can prove for each case that n squared is greater than or equal to 2 to the n minus 1. Okay, we'll start. Uh, this is example 3. And this is probably one of the most difficult ones we'll do today. So um, the proof is we have to prove prove that there are no integers of x and y that satisfies x squared plus five y squared is equal to 10. Okay, so start off. So to start off, we need to show when x squared uh, is greater than 10. So when x squared is greater than 10 is when the absolute value of x is greater than or equal to 4. And then similarly, when 5y squared greater than 10. We solve that divided by 5. When y squared is greater than 2, so that's when the absolute value of y is greater than or equal to 2. Um, because at 1, that only makes it um, 5, which, which is false. So at 2, it's going to be 20 is greater than 10, which holds true. So this means that from this and this, the combinations of x, because absolute value, so it goes from negative to positive, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Similarly, y, y can be negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. So from this combination of x's, we can say that x squared can equal uh, anywhere from 0, 1, 4, 9, and 16. So we can say that 5y squared can equal 0, 5, and 20. Now we notice that there's no combinations of any of these possible numbers that can equal 10. The closest we get is 4 and 5, which is 9. And then um, that's it. There's none that equal 10. So therefore, we proved by proof by cases that there are no, um, in, there are no solutions of integers x and y that proves that x squared plus 5y squared is equal to 10. To sum up, our proof by cases mini lecture. Um, we have three great examples, and for each case of these examples, P implied Q, um, for P being separate cases. And this proof by cases method is really great for 
um, when you have to prove with a finite number of cases or if you cannot prove it with only one case.